So this information is all specific to, uh, to Salt Lake or to the Wasatch Front because that's where we are. So and the Wasatch Front in, the, in 2006, and if you've lived here for any length of time, you know in 2006 your population on the Wasatch Front was much less than it is now in 2010. In 2006, FEMA did a study of the electrical grid and how it would be affected during an earthquake or at, and after an earthquake. What they discovered was that 30 days after, 30 days after the earthquake, there would still be 31,000 homes without electricity. So 31,000 people, well, 31,000 families, 31,000 homes would be without electricity for 30 days or more after the earthquake that they're expecting here. All right, now, when you talk about water, the statistics are much worse, as you can see. After 30 days, there would be 230,000, 230,512 households without water for 30 days plus. More than 30 days, no water to those households. The reason being, well, part of the reason being that what they expect to happen when the earthquake hits the Wasatch Front is for the actual lake bed to raise, not just the water to slosh out, but for the lake bed itself to raise. So all of that water from there is going to go everywhere and it's going to pollute everything and the, your groundwater is going to be polluted. And then there'll be, you know, the, the things that always happen after earthquakes, the chemical spills and those kinds of things, which also pollute the groundwater. Plus, your infrastructure is old, so the infrastructure will be destroyed. So you may have water coming into your home, but it will not be drinkable water. It'll only be water that you can wash clothes and you can flush. <laughs> but it will not be anything you can cook with or you can drink with. So, now that I've scared you. <laughs> there's one more. Um, my son named this the plagues, but <laughs> it's... It's another thing that you need to be aware of if you're living in earthquake country and, you know, just for your own protection, not even to provide refuge, just for yourself. You need to be aware that these are the things that are going to happen, and this is the plagues. You're going to have rodents, you're going to have snakes, and you're going to have mosquitoes like crazy. It always happens. After an earthquake, here especially, you're going to have all this displaced water. And so if it's mosquito time, it's mosquito season, mosquitoes will breed like crazy. So it's important when you prepare your food storage or your emergency supplies that you add things for this, that you add things to, um, to take care of these problems and that you're aware if you're going to be, if you're going to have family sleeping in your backyard, you're going to want to make sure that you've got mosquito netting or that you've got insect repellent or that you've got mouse traps and those kinds of things because you are going to need them. They're, this is just, you've disturbed their homes. Well, nature has disturbed their homes in the earthquake and they're going to be looking for shelter just like your family and friends who are coming to your house looking for shelter. So are these <laughs> going to be looking for shelter. So you need to be prepared to, um, to take care of them, to get rid of them because you really don't want to be sheltering them. Okay, so after Katrina, I did a lot of research and I interviewed a lot of people. And some of the people that I interviewed had been in the position where they had actually been providing refuge. And if you think, well, you know, that's fine, they're on their own if they didn't prepare. Um, just think of the people that you might be providing refuge for right now. Realistically, think about it in your mind so that as we go through these things, you can think about their needs. If you've got friends who have kids here in college, you know, if they, you have college roommates or something, um, you know, whose kids are now in college, uh, will they call you and will they say, well, is it okay if Johnny comes to your house because I'm 100 miles away, I'm 1,000 miles away, I can't get there. Um, if you have family, if you have friends, people that you know are going to need a place to stay, kind of be thinking about them as we talk so that you can think about, okay, what will their needs be? So, your need and needs in general, and their needs, of course, will be for lighting. Remember, the power grid is going to be down. And those 31,000 homes are not the homes that are destroyed. A lot more than 31,000 homes will be 
at the point where they are not inhabitable, at least for part of the time. We went through the earthquakes in Southern California, and there were lots and lots of homes that were condemned and could not be habitable for weeks or for months afterwards just because there was a gas leak in the neighborhood or something like that. So the home itself might not be destroyed, but it won't be inhabitable. People will not be able to go home. So a lot more than 31,000 homes are going to be looking for places to stay. So you're, and a lot more than 31,000 are going to be without lights. So you need to think about these things for lighting um, when you're thinking about providing refuge. How will we provide light for all these, for ourselves and for all these people? I love glow sticks. I really love glow sticks. There's um, a story from Katrina about an evacuation center. It was a church, and it was 50 miles from New Orleans, and people from New Orleans were evacuated to this church, and everything seemed just fine, and they prepared their evening meal, and the lights went out. The lights were out for weeks after that. 50 miles away, the lights went out. So they had, they called church members and said, everybody bring your glow sticks to the church. And that's what they, that's how they lit the church, the restrooms in the church was with glow sticks because they, they don't need batteries. They're good all night long. And so they're not running down a flashlight. And let's face it, people get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. So glow, I love glow sticks. And I just, I always suggest people have glow sticks and then you rotate them. At Halloween, if you have kids, they're perfect. You put them on the kids, and they wear them, and they can be seen when they're trick-or-treating. If um, you can use them to give out at Halloween. Um, we use them on New Year's Eve, you know, wave them in the air. And so we rotate them kind of at birthday parties and things like that. They're really inexpensive. You don't need to worry about batteries, and they're safe around kids. The other, I mean, generators are kind of self-explanatory, you know, about generators. Batteries, my big tip for batteries is store batteries, store plenty of batteries. They will be one of the very first things to go. All these people evacuating, um, they're going to need batteries for everything, from their cell phones to their everything. So batteries will be in very short supply. So store plenty, but never, never, if you want to see an example, I have one at my booth, never store your batteries inside your flashlight or your radio. Always store them separately because batteries do leak. And when they leak, they not only destroy the battery, they destroy whatever it is they were inside. So you may, in an emergency, go to use those flashlights or go to use that radio, and it will be destroyed because your batteries have leaked. And that has happened to us twice in the last two years, that we've had batteries leak and destroyed what they were in. So now even the ones I use around the house all the time, I keep the flashlight and the batteries sitting next to them <laughs> because I don't trust batteries anymore. Another great tip, if you're providing refuge or, or not, if you're just without electricity because there's been a storm and it's out or fire in the mountains and it's out, um, another great tip is to use your solar lighting from your yard. So a lot of us have the solar lighting, you know, that you stick in the ground in the yard. You bring that in the house during the, day, during the evening hours and it provides light. And you can stick it in a house plant. You can stick it, you know, anything that will help to keep it upright, stick it in that, and then in the morning you take it back outside, you recharge it all day, it's free light. And, uh, but you know, a lot of times people don't think about that. You might even look out in the yard and see your solar lights sitting in the yard and never think to bring them in the house. But they're a great resource to bring in the house and use for lighting. Okay, these are the things that are going to be more valuable than gold. These are the things that you really want to make sure that you absolutely positively have plenty of because they are going to be the very first things to go and they will be in very short supply. Food is number one. And again, now think about the, um, the people who you'll be providing refuge for. Do they have little kids? So what kind of food do you need? Maybe, you know, make sure you've got a couple cases of mac and cheese, you know? During an emergency, it's so important that we have familiar foods that kids will eat. Children and senior citizens will often not eat food, and they will often just starve. They'll go for days. They become dehydrated, and they won't eat if they don't like it. And I had a personal experience with that. I had my grandmother living with, 
with me the last few years of her life. And if she didn't like something I was making, she just wouldn't eat. And then she wouldn't eat the next morning. She just, you know, she, she was hungry, but after a point, you don't feel the hunger anymore. And so they won't eat. So make sure you have familiar foods, foods that will be liked and enjoyed by the people you're going to provide refuge for. And if they have dietary concerns, make sure you take that into consideration. If you know someone's diabetic or they have wheat allergies, make sure you have alternative things in your home for them. Fuel, fuel goes really fast now here. Um, you, think, you might think, well, if the earthquake happens in the winter, we're okay, we've got the mountains, nobody's gonna stop us, which is absolutely true. No one's gonna stop you from cutting down trees for fuel because everybody's gonna be in a panic and you know, they're just gonna want you to survive. Nobody's gonna stop you from doing things. They might control where you do it, but there'll be that kind of fuel available. The problem that we had in a, a big way in California when we've had the, the last two big earthquakes there, and we still haven't had the really big one, but um, was that chimneys were damaged. So your home might be fine, but your chimney is damaged, you can't use your fireplace. So you need to make sure that you have fuel for heating and for cooking that is not relying strictly on your fireplace. If you have a fireplace, it's great. You can stick your Dutch oven in there. You can do all kinds of things. But if you don't have it, how are you going to cook? If you don't have your fireplace, do you have a way to cook in the yard? Do you have um, fuel in the yard? Which might be in little propane th tanks. If you've got camping equipment, it might be charcoal. It might be wood. It's, there's all kinds of possibilities. But fuel is an important component. And remember, if you're providing refuge, you're cooking for more than just the two of you or the six of you that you're used to cooking for. Paper products are huge for two reasons. First of all, there's no electricity and there's no good water. So people are going to go and they're going to buy paper plates and paper cups and all that kind of thing, and so they're going to be out of the store. Well, they won't be replenished. They will be one of the very last things to be replaced because when you freight things, the freight, the truckers get paid by the weight. Well, toilet paper, paper plates, they don't weigh anything. They are going to be the last things that truckers are going to go and pick up and transport. They're going to pick up the heavy stuff because they get paid more to do that and transport the heavier things. So paper products are huge. My friends laugh at me because I have so much toilet paper stored, but I figure that in an emergency, it, it will be a huge trading commodity. I will be able to trade anybody, anything for my toilet paper. Um, and it will not be replaced soon in your stores. OK, hygiene. Remember, people who are leaving their homes are going to leave in a hurry. And an earthquake, you know, specifically here, we're talking about earthquakes because that's your most likely devastating disaster right here. So. In an emergency, with an earthquake, you have no warning. I mean, it just happens, and your whole world is turned upside down in 40 seconds. And so nobody has time. You don't have time. If you have an earthquake and things are falling off of your wall and your home is destroyed, you cannot go back in to get your 72-hour kits. You cannot go back in to raid your medicine cabinets. You're just stuck. I mean, once you crawl out, you are out. And then once they, they come and they condemn your home, you're really out. Then they really will not, not let you back in. So you have to remember that for anybody who is evacuating to your home and you're providing refuge for them, they will not have hygiene supplies with them. So when you see a special on toothbrushes, you know, go make sure you have 20 toothbrushes because those people are going to come and they aren't going to have them, I guarantee you. They will not have toothpaste, they will not have toothbrushes, they will not have basic hygiene items, shampoo, soap, they just won't have it. All of those things, most of those things store really, really well. If you buy toothbrushes and you buy bars of soap, you can keep them for 50 years. They'll be just as good 50 years from now as they are now. So a lot of these things, you know, it's, you just do it once. It's not anything you're going to have to replace. You're not going to throw it away in 15 years because it's gotten bad. So it's not an investment that's, you know, that you ever have to regret and say, why did I spend $20 on toothbrushes? Um, 
and you know, you can just rotate through them as you need new ones yourself. Medicines and, me and prescription drugs. If you, if you have an earthquake here and everything is fine here, I would suggest the very first thing you do, your home is fine, everybody is safe, you go to the local Rite Aid, I don't know what you have here, <laughs> you know, a pharmacy store right away, first thing, and you stock up on medications that you normally use if it's, you know, flu season, whatever your family us normally uses for aches, pains, headaches, that kind of thing. And if you have a prescription, you get it refilled. Any prescription you have, you get refilled immediately as soon as the earthquake happens because once those people get here, five, six, seven hours, ten hours from now, that's what they're going to do. They're going to have aches and pains and headaches, and they are going to go to the store, and they are going to want those things. They are going to need their prescriptions refilled because they won't have them. And so they're going to go, and they're going to get their prescriptions refilled. And you'll be out of luck. So if uh, something happens here and you know people will be evacuating, you make sure you're protected first. Go stuck up on those things. Okay, plan to entertain. Remember that just because people are, your home is safe, it doesn't mean you're going to have electricity. There's 31,000 homes that won't. So for a, over 30 days, there's 100,000 that won't for a, you know, a week. But you won't have electricity. What are you going to do with your own family? What's your own family going to do with that electricity? You can't put in a video game. You can't watch a movie. You can't do any of those things you're used to. So what do you have? This was a huge problem after Katrina because people were so compassionate. They wanted to take people in. They wanted to be of help. And they would end up at churches for evacuation. And then, you know, the pastor, the bishop, whomever was in charge of that congregation would call their members and say, would you take this family in? And sure, we'll take them in. Well, what do you do with them then? You know, what do you do with all these people in your home? So do you have games that are age appropriate for all ages, not just adults? Um, how about books? When I was growing up, and I'm sure in a lot of families, my kids do this with their kids, so I know it's not completely an old-fashioned idea. We would read books. We would get, you know, classics. And we read through Little Women or something like that as a family. And so do you have those kinds of things? Do you have books that you could read together as a family and that are age appropriate? Um, <clears throat> and crafts, of course, what do you have that you could, you know, keep people busy with? Okay. Sanitation. Sanitation, again, is, is a huge problem after an earthquake. There will be, there will be, you have wonderful new bridges being built, and they're all being built to earthquake standards, but that does not mean that they're not going to have cracks, that they're not going to be unusable. They might not fall down and kill anyone. But that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be somebody that says, no, nope, sorry, you can't use that bridge anymore. And there are going to be potholes in the roads that were never there before. There's going to be all kinds of things. And, you know, we talked about before snakes and rodents and all that kind of stuff on, going on. There will not be trash pickup. That will not be the priority. And so it will, trash will accumulate. So how will you take care of it? And especially if you're used to taking care of it for your little family, and now all of a sudden you have these other people. One of the things that I was told over and over again when I interviewed people after Katrina was that they had made arrangements with their family to provide refuge. You know, that was their out-of-state contact person. You know, this is my out-of-area or out of area contact person. This is where I'm going to go live. And so they were expecting their family to come. Well, their family came. But their can't family came with two or three other families because those two or three other families didn't have anywhere to go. And they said, oh, my brother won't mind. You can come with us. Oh, my uncle's got a big farm. You can come with us. And so they were expecting, you know, a family of four, a family of six, and they ended up with three or four families. So don't be surprised. But in that case, you absolutely have to have thought about garbage. What are you going to do? Now, remember, you don't have water to wash dishes. You don't have electricity for the dishwasher. And 
So you're going to have all these paper plates and all these things. So how are you going to handle it? Do you have some way to burn paper in your backyard? Do you have trash bags for things that are not burnable? <laughs> um, what, how, how are you going to handle garbage? Because you may have, you may have it pile up. There might not be garbage collection on a weekly basis. They may be three weeks before they get to you. So how do you handle garbage? And the other question is, how do you handle waste? How are you going to handle human waste? How are you going to handle all of those bathroom details for people who have, are now at your home? This is incredibly important if you're on a well and a septic system because most septic systems can't handle 25 people a day. So if you're on a septic system, you really, really have to figure out what are you going to do? Um, am I going to have a porta potty kind of a situation? That's fine. You can line a five gallon bucket and get a potty seat and have chemicals and change it every day or two and, you know, and store that in a plastic garbage bin until you can dispose of it correctly. You can dig a hole and you can bury it. There's ways to handle it, but you have to plan ahead of time. And then if you have a potty situation, do you really want that in your house? You know, so if you're, you've got a porta potty, what are you going to do? Do you have a little pup tent? You know, do you have a little three man tent or something that people can kind of go into and that's the potty and you can zip it up and they can have privacy in the backyard? How are you going to handle it? So think about not just, not just if you're providing refuge, but just for your own family. How would you actually handle human waste? Cash is king. After an emergency, absolutely, there is nothing better except food and water than cash after an emergency. When the, credit, when the uh, electricity is out, if the electricity is out here, obviously there's no ATMs and there's no credit cards. So you have to have cash for anything you want to buy. Absolutely have to have cash. The other problem is that the banks may be closed. So if, even if there's electricity, if the banks can't get through to their computer because, like, you have, say, a, a Utah bank, a local bank, they can't get through to their computer, they don't know how much money is in your account because their computer is someplace where the system is down. They can't access it. So you're stuck. You, can, you might have plenty of money in the bank. You can't withdraw it. If there's no electricity, they are not opening their doors. They have no security with that electricity. So... Banks will close. Absolutely, they will close. If the bank happens to be destroyed in the process of the earthquake, they're closed. They'll be closed for months. So cash is absolutely king. You have to think about having cash. That was another thing that I heard from people who were miles and miles and miles away, was that people would come into town with their ATMs. They would have driven you know, four, five, six hours, which is usually a one or two hour drive, but because everybody's evacuating, looking for a safe place, takes five or six hours to get someplace. They get there, they go to the ATM, they absolutely clean it out because they haven't had anything along the way where they could get cash. So now they go and they just clean out the ATM. That leaves you with nothing. So even if your electricity is up here, your bank is open, your ATMs are filled, they have to wait now until they get more cash to refill the ATMs. So you have to have a stash of cash somewhere. Now, I, I know somebody who went to um, an LDS church cannery and canned a can of cash. The only thing is, I would not recommend that. She, she did not write on it, cash because she didn't want her husband to know there was cash in there because she was afraid he would go in and he would spend it and then it wouldn't be there. Well, now she doesn't know where it is because she didn't label it. So I wouldn't, make, I wouldn't suggest that you do that. I would suggest that you, you come up with some kind of a system, though, so that you've got a couple of hundred dollars in cash. One of the things that happened where I was telling you the electricity went out um, at the church, at the evacuation center. Well, that's what happened. People came, they evacuated to this man's home. He was living in that same area. They evacuated to his home. They didn't think anything about having money with them. 
And of course, it's the last thing you think about when you've just lost your home. And they got there and they wanted to go to the bank. Well, 70 miles away, the electricity was out. They needed things at the store. He had cash, so he was lending people cash that he didn't even know who had evacuated to his house because his nephew had brought his friends <laughs> to evacuate to his house. So he, was, he had cash in his home, so he was able to loan people cash so they could go get what they needed. But, and most of them paid him back. But that's why I say cash is king because you can't do anything after an emergency unless you have cash. Okay. All right. This is, goes back to what we talked about before. When a disaster strikes, um, the first thing you do, you go fill up your gas tank. Everybody who's been coming your way to evacuate, their gas tanks are going to be empty. We had friends when they were evacuating for the San Francisco wildfires. It took them hours to get what would normally take an hour. So all that time, they're sitting, their car's idling on the freeway, and they're eating up their gas. So when they get here, they're going to need gas. So an earthquake happens, you just absolutely assume that people are going to come here to take refuge. Run out, fill up every gas tank you've got. Fill it up because, again, how long is it going to take for tankers to come in and to replace that? So in your, in your local gas station. So fill up your tank first. Um, buy anything fresh that you want. Go to the grocery store, clean them out of produce, milk, eggs, anything fresh that you want. Even if you haven't been affected, if you know, you know that Draper's been affected, you're fine in Sandy, or Sandy's been affected and you're fine in Logan or Ogden or wherever you're from, um, go and, you know, stock up because they're coming your way. So get fresh things. Um, get your generator ready. Make sure you have fuel for your generator just in case because power lines do go down hours and days after the disaster. As one thing fails, then the next thing fails, the next thing fails. They think they've got it repaired, something happens, and it triggers something else. So make sure you have supplies for your generator, uh, gas for your generator. And um, remember that the most important place for people to get supplies to is going to be the disaster area itself. So if the earthquake is here in Sandy and you live north of here, they are going to send everything to Sandy. So just assume that your grocery stores are not going to get stocked, restocked as fast because they're going to send it here because people here are going to be homeless and hungry, and so it's coming here. And the government always, always does that. That's just, they divert everything, and, you know, your grocery store has no choice. That's what they have to do. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Have a great expo.